everyone. We'll start. Maybe some people will come over from the other side, but um, I'm going to start. Uh, can you guys hear me well? I just hear myself. But so. Okay, cool. So I'm going to try to explain uh, Arc, the new uh, Bitcoin Layer 2 protocol. It was actually, I think, announced by Barack here at this conference a year ago. Um, since then, it has changed a lot and we made a lot of progress. So who am I? My name is Steven Roos, been a Bitcoin developer for a while, used to work on the Liquid team at Blockstream, uh, big contributor to Rust Bitcoin and adjacent libraries, and right now uh, working on Arc. So if you think about Bitcoin and payments, we currently have the Lightning Network. I'm not going to explain how the Lightning Network is, uh, works. It's like a payment network with channels. Um, but what's very distinct about the Lightning Network is it works with these channels, and you need to have these like UTXOs between any two people. And it means that if you don't have a channel that uh, with a counterparty where there is some money on the other side of the channel, you cannot receive um, any payments. Other than the whole on-chain problem of like um, making channels, closing channels, potentially like doing on-chain transactions, the inbound liquidity problem is one of the problems that is the hardest uh, to work around because you need to convince some other party to actually lock up some, like, some liquidity that then they can push to, to your side if you want to receive. So the biggest problem is if you want to onboard someone on Lightning, want to send them 10 bucks, it's like really hard. So Arc, the main uh, benefit of Arc is it doesn't have this problem and it tries to maintain as much of the benefits of being a full off-chain protocol like Lightning. So how does it work? Um, it's basically a new layer two protocol. Um, it can be interoperable with Lightning. We'll see that later on. Um, it's built on a totally different model than Lightning. So there's no channels, there's no two-party things, there's no network. Um, it's basically built around the concept of sharing a on-chain UTXO with multiple people um, and then creating parts of this UTXO, what we will call VTXOs, and then exchanging these VTXOs for other VTXOs, right, in an off-chain manner. So how does this work? I'm going to try and explain it um, step by step. So the, the core idea of the protocol uh, was totally built on this idea of covenants. Right now we're like finding ways to not need covenants uh, in the beginning, and we've also changed the protocol significantly. But I'm going to like start with the, the pure version of the protocol, the simple version, and then we're going to like see some of the challenges and like how we're going to work around those challenges. So what's a covenant? Um, I think everyone knows by now what the covenant is. It's like a way to restrict where your money goes. And actually covenants, like we'll see later, can be emulated by pre-signing transactions and then uh, deleting the keys. So, okay, so imagine we have, like I'm going to have these graphs where the on-chain transactions are going to be above the line and then what's below the line are real Bitcoin transactions that you can broadcast at any time. But we're going to, of course, try to avoid that because we don't want to pay the fees. But the on-chain transactions are on the chain, right? So imagine you have an on-chain transaction with four Bitcoin. And there's a covenant attached to this um, output. So the only way to spend this output is to fulfill the covenant. And the covenant says you need to make a transaction that makes four outputs and gives one Bitcoin to each. So Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave, they know what's in this covenant. They know how to fulfill this covenant. So they can at, all, at any time broadcast this transaction and get their one Bitcoin. So they have like 100% safe guarantee. I have one Bitcoin. All I need to do is like take this transaction that I know and put it on the blockchain. And then I have my one, my one Bitcoin, right? So now imagine there's a, a whole lot of Alice and Bob's and Carol and Dave's. Um, this transaction is going to be really big. So an equivalent um, system like this would be to do this as like a tree. So like the covenant says, you need to create an transaction that again has two covenants. And then recursively, each of the leaves in this tree gives a transaction with a single output um, that also gives um, Alice, Bob, Carol and Dave one Bitcoin. So the, the construction technically is um, the same, is similar. The only thing, like it looks like more transactions here. But it will be less transactions if the user grows, especially the number of transactions that a single party needs to put on the chain to get um, their, their Bitcoin back. So this, this concept where Alice has an um, undeniable way to get her one Bitcoin output on the chain through a series of transactions that no one can contest is what we're going to call a virtual transaction output. So this is the transaction output that Alice kind of has in her pocket, but she is not on the chain yet, but she can put it on the chain anytime she wants. So it's a virtual UTXO. So what is ARC? ARC is simply a protocol where you have these VTXOs and you kind of want to spend them and create new VTXOs in like totally different trees. So like ARC is going to be a, a series of those trees and anyone who has a leave in this tree, so anyone who has a VTXO can decide to spend it and like give up their VTXO and then create new VTXOs. 
And this is fun because it looks very much like a normal Bitcoin transaction because you have inputs and outputs. There is never such a thing. It's like dot dot lines because there's never such a thing as an actual transaction that looks like that. But conceptually, it's the same. Like you spend certain inputs, you create certain outputs. And because they're also just normal outputs, we'll see that there's an asterisk. But you can do all kinds of things you can actually do like on UTXOs, like DLCs and then channels and all that, um, as if they were normal UTXOs. So how can we do this? Um, so we, we saw this, this construction. Um, now, for like we see here, like Alice will try to give up ownership of her VTXO and get back ownership of two new VTXOs, right? So in this construction, Alice wants some way that she can give up ownership of her VTXO. What she can do is she can create another transaction and sign it and then give the money to someone, right? But she can always just like sign it and give it to herself again. And then like this someone is now fighting over this money. So this is not safe. So we're going to have to make some changes to this construction. So one, uh, two changes we're going to make. The first change we need to make is to make this impossible. And what we're going to do is we're going to in introduce a third party. And this script is not just going to be Alice's script. It's going to be Alice co-signing with some third party or Alice after some timeouts. So conceptually for Alice, she still has an irrevocable guarantee that she has this money. She just will have to wait for 24 hours to get it on the chain. Um, but she can circumvent this 24 hours by co-signing with this um, ASP, right? So now if Alice wants to send ownership of this VTXO to the ASP, she can sign it together with the ASP and then she cannot double spend it, right? So this is a way for Alice to basically give up her ownership and give it back to the ASP or give it to the ASP. So then we have a way for Alice to send her money to the ASP, but then the ASP will have to promise Alice, we're gonna introduce ASP later, but like the ASP is gonna orchestrate this and they will have to give back some other money. Like for example, Alice has one Bitcoin here, she wants to send half a Bitcoin to Eve and half a Bitcoin change. So she wants to know that if she gives up her one Bitcoin, she gets this like half a Bitcoin and this half a Bitcoin back. So how can we make this, um, how can we make this atomic, right? So here we have Alice's VTXO. There's other VTXOs that we just left out. And potentially there's gonna be a new tree with new VTXOs and Alice wants there to be an output a VTXO for Eve and one for herself, which is gonna be her change. You see, you don't see the asterisk here, but it's her change, right? So how can we how can we do this? Alice can sign her transaction like we saw before and actually sign the money back to the service provider. And then the service provider will say, oh, in return you get this, right? But like, who's going first? If, if the ASP broadcasts this, Alice cannot sign. And if Alice signs this, the ASP can just never put this on the chain. So we want to make this atomic. We want to make sure that Alice only gives her money to the ASP if she knows for sure that in return she gets these two other uh, VTXOs back. And the way to do that is using a trick called connectors. So if this transaction also has another output, and this output is an input to this transaction, that means that if Alice signs this with Ccash all, this transaction is only valid if this transaction exists. And the ASP will have to use this output to get this forfeit, right? So now this transaction and the creation of this outputs are linked because this is all committed to in this output and then here, and then this transaction ID is actually in this prevout um, so that these two things happening are atomic. Um, now, obviously there's gonna be a lot of these inputs and a lot of these outputs and we don't wanna create like a whole lot of connector outputs. So we can just do the same trick as we did with this. It can just be a whole tree of connector outputs and then like, and each of these corresponds to someone forfeiting one of their inputs and then creating new outputs, right? So that the ASP will have to unroll this tree if they ever have to contest Alice trying to claim her money back. But ideally, this would never have to go on the chain. So, so we saw how we could do that, but we still have some problem because this is still a covenant. And even if Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave have all spent their VTXOs, the only way for this money to move anywhere is to go here and then for this money to go there, right? So that, that kind of stuck still because then the ASP will have to use all these forfeit transactions to get the money back. So we're gonna make another change. The second change we're gonna make to this construction is we're gonna have an expiry on those covenants. So this whole construction is just gonna expire after a certain time. It can be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, and that means that the caveat on the VTXOs is that they have an expiry. So Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave need to make sure that they spend their VTXO before they expire and spend them to themselves to get a new one if they don't wanna make transactions. So if they make transactions, it doesn't matter, right? So the two caveats here are, you need to wait 24 hours if you want to get your money back unilaterally, and you need to make sure you spend them within the expiry window, otherwise um, the ASP could claim your money. And now what will happen is Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave will have spent their money before the expiry, 
And then on chain, the ASP can just use this money and do something else with it. Can use it for another arc round or for some liquidity, whatever. So then, then all of this we can just forget about. All of this we just did. We can just like throw it all out and just use the ASP can use the money for something else. So that's great. Now if Alice went on chain, if Alice be like, oh, I don't trust it or whatever, I'm, I'm going on chain. Then the ASP can just still use the other ones as if they were like you know leftover. So like the people going on chain just leave the leftover accumulated behind, and then the ASP can claim those. But ideally, just what happens is everything just goes away, and we can forget about everything. So this is basically the ARC protocol. Um, it's a way to spend VTXOs in return for new VTXOs. Now, what's the protocol? Uh, like I said. Um, there's going to be an, AS an ASP, and the ASP is going to orchestrate rounds. So like in each round, people can do this atomic spending of VTXOs for new ones, and each round will result in one of those transactions that you saw at the bottom that basically um, has the, the tree output with all the VTXOs, the connector output with all the connectors, and then some inputs and maybe some change from um, some liquidity provider. So that's where the ASP comes in. Um, someone needs to orchestrate these rounds, coordinate all the people that want to spend, like ask who wants to spend which inputs, who wants to spend with which outputs, and then make sure that there's enough liquidity to front all the outputs, and then the ASP will later reclaim the liquidity from all the forfeited inputs. So the important part is that the service provider is only a coordinator, right? It never controls users' money because users always have their unilateral exit and users always just spend the money back to themselves in new VTXOs, the, the ASP just has a pool of extra liquidity that they use to like borrow the user until the input uh, expires. So the users always have a unilateral exit uh, path and can always get their money back if the ASP would uh, refuse to service them or disappear or, or become bad. So why is this fun? First of all, because we, do, we can do um, UTXO style off-chain transactions. Uh, that's something that um, Lightning cannot really do. You can do certain constructions like DLCs on Lightning but it's like nicer if you just actually have a UTXO that you can do all the same things with. You can do multisig, you can do DLCs, you can do even channels on UTXOs. You can do all the things kind of you can do with UTXOs, um, but then off chain with a small asterisk because you need to think about the timeouts. Um, so you can even make HTLCs um, and channels. Um, the on chain footprint is kind of minimal. So every round is one transaction with two outputs and maybe two inputs or something. So the on-chain footprint is shared amongst all, all the users and happens only once per round. It's a really simple protocol from the standpoint of coordination. Like Lightning has this peer-to-peer -peer feature negotiation. All your peers can have different server like implementations, different features, uh, support. And this protocol is purely client-server. So the server is the ASP. It does everything. And the, the, the users just say what they want. And they verify if their part in the protocol is fine. And all the rest they don't care about. So it simplifies um, a lot over conceptually um, over Lightning. And the biggest, the biggest thing that we like about it is anyone can receive. You can just download the app or download the whatever wallet and send someone your address, and you can receive some ARC coins, some VTXO, and you don't need to set up channels. You don't need to wait. You don't need to do anything else. So first of all, Lightning compatibility, right? I'm, I've been saying Lightning twice. So actually, you can make HLC straight from your VTXO. So you can make you can route Lightning payments through your um, VTXO. Uh, the easiest way would be if the if the ASP would become an LSP, right? And then you can just have the HLC with your LSP and uh, with your ASP, and then ASP can just route it on the on the Lightning network. Um, so that would be the easiest way. Another thing you can do is you can actually create Lightning channels in the leaves of the trees and on your VTXOs, and then it becomes kind of like a channel factory of, of, of sorts where the commitment transactions are actually in the VTXOs. And the only caveat is that your channels expire, but it's very easy to just like close a channel and create a new one because it's just an ARC transaction. Um, so this is two ways that actually ARC and Lightning can work well together um, and integrate. So there's a lot of questions about this. There's a lot of like um, things that People have talked about like, oh, but what about this and what about that? So I'm going to go over some of them. So first of all, it's like, okay, we don't have covenants. <laughs> uh, so like how I explained it, everything uses covenants. The second one is what people talk, uh, talk about a lot is liquidity. Like, oh, isn't the liquidity requirement going to be so high that you need all the Bitcoin in the, in the network? We're going to talk about that. And the third one is the, the exit cost, right? If you have an, a VDXO of a small value, like, does it even make sense to actually have it if you cannot get it on the chain? So we're going to talk briefly about those. So the first one is Clark. Clark is a version of Arc that doesn't use covenants. 
Uh, so it's a covenantless arc. And what we're going to do is instead of using covenants, like I said in the beginning, we can emulate covenants using pre-signed transactions. So uh, I sometimes call pseudo covenants. Um, it's basically everything you want to do, instead of encoding it in a covenant, you just create it, sign it, and then delete the keys. And if the keys, if the deleting of the keys is sufficiently secure, then the covenant holds. So in this construction, instead of using covenants, we can use multisigs. So the the intuitive straight, can you everyone see that? The intuitive straightforward way to do this is that everyone who's affected by the covenant above them in the tree needs to needs to cosign, right? So in this one is just Alice and the ASP, Alice and the ASP, and then here Alice Bob and the ASP because they they are the parties that don't want this covenant to change. Now this means that the people in the leaves are the receivers, right? And the receivers are not necessarily online. Like, it would be nice if, like in Bitcoin, you could just receive without being aligned. And in the previous protocol using covenants, the receivers don't have to do anything. They just receive this covenant and they don't need to be aligned. They don't need to even know that this happens. They can just later on find out that they have some money and then, then have that money. So this is kind of unfortunate because if you do it this way, that means that all the, all the receivers have to be online, participate in the arc round in order for them to receive. So an alternative we can do here is what if instead of having all these receivers sign all these nodes in this tree, what if instead all the senders sign this tree, right? The senders already are online. They all need to sign their forfeit transaction. There's going to be whole, a whole lot of them. And if all of them sign literally every node with a 100% multisig, that means that only one of them actually has to do the right thing, delete their key, and then the whole covenant is safe. Right, so we're going to see later on why this might actually be a valuable model. But even even as simple as this, if there's like a thousand people participating, only one of them, including the ASP, or including the ASP, um, need to do the right thing, and then your covenant is safe. So if you're part of this, for example, yourself, or the person who sent you money, um, it's already safe. But I'm going to come back to this. Yeah, so this is an N of N, so a single honest party makes this work. And then we can create this on Bitcoin today and actually have uh, using just musics where this is all signed by everyone who's participating in the, in the rounds at that point. So the second thing I want to talk about is liquidity. Um, the liquidity requirements of ARC is actually quite, a, quite not trivial and not intuitive because it's kind of depending on how fast people transact and not about how much money is in the system, right? Because the money in the system is mostly the user's money and the liquidity provider only needs to provide liquidity when people move the money. So it's kind of like a function of the velocity of money. Um, so because what happens is if I have a one Bitcoin VTXO and I'm spending it, the ASP needs to provide one Bitcoin for this new VTXO that gets created. But the ASP gets this money back the moment my input VTXO expires. So it's a function of how old my VTXO is. If my VTXO is very fresh and it's going to take 14 days, then ASP gives me one Bitcoin and then only gets the Bitcoin back after 14 days. But if mine expires in one hour, the ASP gets the money back already in one hour. So if we can find a way where we can actually incentivize users to use VTXOs that are almost about to expire, we can really narrow the liquidity requirements um, for this protocol. Um, so one way we can do that is by, and this also introduces some other nice benefits, is we can actually have a way where we can make ARC payments without having to make rounds. And this means that um, we don't need liquidity because we only need liquidity when we do ARC rounds. When we do out of rounds, we don't need this liquidity. And we can then send our VTXOs directly um, from one party to another. This was originally introduced as an idea by so uh, Ruben Sompson. We call it then the Sompson shortcut. Uh, we've reiterated a little bit on this idea. But the way it works is, uh, wrong button. So we have this construction, like we said before, right? So this is our normal ARC payment. You sign your forfeit, you get back your other thing, and you use a connector to make it atomic. Now, this thing could just be an other transaction, right? Let's say Alice wants to send to Eve. She can just make a new transaction that sends this, that takes this VTXO, creates new new ones, one for Eve, one change. And then she asks the ASP, hey, can you put your signature here as well? And then Eve now has another thing, which is also a VTXO, it's also a path of multiple transactions you can put on the chain and then claim that money uh, on the chain. There's just a single, there's just a, a caveat that this is a multisig between Alice and the ASP. So Eve needs to rely on the ASP and Alice not colluding to double sign this. And some people that know about state chains 
will see that this is actually what, how a state chain protocol looks like, right? So you have a coordinator who cosigns the transfers of the VDXOs or the, of the UTXOs in state chains, and you rely on the coordinator never double signing. Um, one nice aspect of this is that it's very easy to prove that the coordinator double signs, right? So if the ASP is getting a lot of business from this, they obviously have an incentive not to double sign. And Alice obviously trusts this because she, she knows she will not double sign. So for Eve, she can either like choose to, like Eve now has a VTXO, right? And Eve can decide, okay, this is fine. Like I, I like the model. I trust Alice or the ASP to not do this because I can go on Twitter and call out the, v the ASP for cheating on me. But if she doesn't like this, she can actually immediately use this VTXO as if it was a normal VTXO, send it back to herself in the next round using a normal ARC payment, and then she gets a normal ARC VTXO, like not the one with the rich state chain thing, right? So this is, this is something that Eve can do. But Eve can also decide not to do that, and just later on, if she wants to send some money to Fred, just do it again, and then create another VTXO, right? So now Fred has this big VTXO that he knows is if Alice and ASP or even ASP collude together, they can take it again. So Fred can then choose to cycle it back into an arc or she can, or he can choose to, to keep it around, right? So this is like a, an opt-in cheaper model where you can have instant transactions. All you need to do is add the ASP to cosign. The ASP will just remember and never double cosign the same transaction. And you can instantly send these VTXOs to someone else without having to wait for, uh, for the arc round and without having to use any um, input liquidity. And what's nice about this, like it works a lot like normal transactions suddenly because you can have multiple inputs, multiple outputs. The only thing you need to think about is that your, your timeouts, of course, match. So like the timeout of this ones will always be the minimum of the timeouts of all the inputs. Um, so when it's going to time out, you're going to do it again like I have in this slide. Uh, I think it was this slide. Where you're going to like spend your VTXO, whatever, whatever long the chain is, spend it and forfeit it and then get it into the next um, tree. So we call this our core, our out of round payments. Uh, you get instant transactions, uh, really easy. You just add ASP to cosign and you, you get a VTXO. They're super cheap, there's no liquidity requirement. Um, well, asterisks, because right now you need to pay min relay fee, but at some point, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> fees there are something that we need to figure out because it's like, ideally we forget about the fees, but we probably have to subtract them from the values anyway, but then maybe accounting wise, we can put them back in later. Um, this is opt out, like if you don't trust, if you don't like this model, you can just immediately take the VTXO that you received, cycle it back in and get a full ARC VTXO. Uh, so this is like nice that it's opt in uh, or opt out, whatever. And it saves a lot of liquidity um, because you can choose to hold on to your VTXOs until the very last moment and only then, then use it, right? So because eventually if the ASP needs to provide you with liquidity, it will have to charge you for that. Like the ASP is not going to like give this for free. So the user will pay for his liquidity. So if a user constantly spends, spends, spends his VTXO, he's going to always pay a high fee. So the user in this case can decide, okay, I can just wait until the last moment and pay a really low fee, or I can immediately get out of this like state chain model and pay a slightly higher fee. And what's really nice about this actually, like we saw before in the Clark model, right, we decided that it would be nicer if all the senders would be signing the covenants instead of the receivers. But if people are sending out of round transactions and then cycling their own VTXOs back in, that means that all the senders are actually the receivers, right? Because it's, it's always users using their own VTXO and refreshing it into a new one. So if, if you do that, you, you fully trust the Clark model because you're also the one who's co-signing the whole covenant tree, right? So if the senders and the receivers, Clark actually makes more sense because then like you never rely on someone else's signature or on someone else's key deletion. So the last thing, um, that I want to talk about is a unilateral exit problem, right? Um, there's two cases where a user might want to unilaterally exit. One is if the ASP disappears, like it just goes out of business, loses its keys or something, or burns, and then suddenly the whole ARC needs to like get on the chain and get all their money back. So this is obviously a disaster scenario. It's going to like create a whole lot of um, transaction in the mempool, but because like these trees are shared by all these people, it means that the people with larger amounts in their leaves are gonna have an incentive to pay higher fees for, the, for their branches. And it means that people with smaller amounts are gonna already have some of their, part of their path paid for by someone else. And then the cost for the smaller VTXO holders is gonna be lower because other people might be paying for their transactions. 
So this is kind of okay-ish um, in the individual sense. Maybe on the larger scale, like the whole network, might this might not be uh, nice, but we'll have to do some math on that. And the second case you might have to unilateral exit is if the ASP is just censoring you, right? If the ASP knows your VTXO is only 10 bucks and it's gonna cost you 20 bucks to get it back on chain, I can just like ignore you and eventually I get the 10 bucks. So that's obviously a problem. Um, Oh yeah, so this is where you really do a unilateral exit and not like a mass exit. Um, and the cost can easily exceed the, the fee that it costs to go online. And one potential solution we can use here is we can use something like watchtowers that kind of, that kind of control honest behavior of the ASP where you can prove by using some watchtowers that you're being censored. It's, it's a really hard problem to prove to someone that someone is not talking with you, right? I feel like with watchtowers, it could kind of be done, right? If you have some trusted parties that then negotiate for you with ASP and prove that you're being, that you're being, um, or a test, not proof, a test that you're being censored. It's definitely iffy and shady kind of thing. Um, of course, the ASP doesn't really have an incentive to do that because if he gets called out, then he's gonna lose business. But I feel like watchtowers can slightly solve the problem where people are gonna get censored. Um, but of course, if you get censored, you can always go online. Uh, you can always go uh, on chain, I'm sorry. And worst case, you lose your money, but ASP also doesn't gain it. So that's that's basically the state of the protocol right now. So where are we with uh, things? We have an implementation of Clark on Bitcoin. Um, it's using music 2 for all the co-signing. Uh, we also have an implementation on Liquid using the direct introspection covenants. Um, and that's it. And we have a website, rprotocol.org, with some explanations, and a presentation can be found here. Are there questions? Sorry if I spoke too fast. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows the whole tree. But the whole system, the, the whole system consists of many trees, right? You have um, one tree every round. But ideally, I mean, the whole, the whole working of the tree, actually, I didn't talk about that. There's also a privacy slide that I left out of this one. Uh, normally, the whole system is, is, is public. Everyone knows everything, right? Um, there's two ways you can do discovery of new money. Like one is like the ASP publishes all the trees and you can just look in the leaves like, is, is this PubKey mine? Another way is that the sender just sends a package to the receiver like, hey, you got this money, it's in this leave, right? Both of them seem reasonable. Um, yeah, so you need to know the whole tree and you need to know also your leave. And if you know your leave, you know the size of the tree, right? You can extrapolate uh, your branch, I mean. I think so, huh? Ah, the question was, do you really need the connectors? I can actually go back to the slide. The question was, do you need the connectors or can you use HDLCs? I think you can't because, sorry, I wanna go back to the slide all the way. Yes. I think you need it because otherwise this could just not be confirmed, right? Like where would, like, Where would it be revealed? Somewhere here or somewhere here? Uh, I know, I hear what you're saying. I think. Yeah, because I remember having thought about this, but I don't remember uh, why. We, 
why we needed this, but I think it like, because then you need to commit to this first, so then this needs to be broadcast first. And this. Yeah. Yeah, so then, yeah, so then the, pro the problem is then this goes on chain first, and then the user commits to this, but the, but the user doesn't know this or something, right? It cannot claim it because it needs a secret, right? But then the ASP can provide this liquidity and the user can just not do this. Like the, the secret needs to go here first and then here, right? If you just put the secret here first, the ASP can just claim it and not do this? Yeah. Yeah, but if you commit to the secret first, you need to commit also the money. And then if the user doesn't cooperate, then the money's on the chain until expiry and the user doesn't do it, right? Stuff not happening. Well, But I don't see how it would go because, like, this needs for the user to be ag agreeing to giving your money for a si for a pre-image. They need to know that there is something. Like, if the user wants to give up their money in return for pre-image, it needs to know that it gets something back for the pre-image. So then, this needs to be on-chain first. But then, if the user ag doesn't agree with that, doing it after all, then this is on-chain. The US the ASP is not going to lose it, but it also it will also put it there for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if if you would like once once you have VTXOs on chain, if you send from one arc to another, you would just either use Lightning or it's or a direct swap, right? But that's that's once both things are on chain. But I think when you do one off chain for an on chain thing, like it's like who goes first, and this guy needs to go first because otherwise this guy can maybe not exist. Right. But I, I, I think I think the difference is that you have an on-chain versus off-chain instead of an off-chain versus off-chain. Yeah. Uh, you wanna? Sorry. You wanna? You wanna react to this or? Ah. Uh, well, we can we can try figure it out later because. Okay. Go first. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I mean, in the tree, the the ASP could just like commit to some ordering, right? And then some random based on the pub keys or something or based on some secret plus the pub keys. Like if you can somehow prove this is kind of pseudo random, it should be fine. I think, I think the user is going to obviously notice that if it's not pseudo random. So like there might be some incentive for the ASP to kind of like, Use an actual deterministic pseudo random, and then everyone. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, we talked about this. Yeah, but I think if the ASP plugs in a lot of money here, it's gonna need a lot more liquidity than it might be worth it to steal this money. I don't know. Like, if there's a ten dollar here, and you need to put like a hundred or a thousand dollar here for every ten dollar you're gonna, I don't know. Like, they, like. Maybe you can make it look like it's fair, but it's not, but yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. With this or with the LSP thing, or what's that? Yeah. No, I mean you don't need to make a channel with everyone. I don't I don't think so. I mean But like okay so so about capital efficiency, right? Yes. But like <laughs> an NPC like what milk So like so like efficiency is like how much money did you just own over how much money does the infrastructure provider have, right? Well Yeah, but some part of these participants uh, MPC. Yeah, but only if you go on a round, right? So like if you not if you do out of round payments. So like so like so like like I said, on the original ARC protocol without out of round payments, the liquidity requirements depends on the velocity. But if, if, if you assume many people are going to use out of round payments and they're going to just wait until the last moment they're comfortable enough to cycle their VTXOs out, then it becomes a function of the total volume, the total capacity, right? If ever. No, they're not. Yeah, with the ASP. Yeah, then it's a state, a state change model. Yeah, yeah. But it, the incentives there might be quite well aligned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if you're if you're going to make lightning payments instead of arc payments, like if you have an arc, if you have arc VTXOs, you can make lightning payments by just opening a channel on your leave with ASP and just always sending a little bit away from your leave, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. But you do it over over Lightning, right? You you send a Lightning from one ASP to the other ASP, then to your VTXO. What I was what I was wanting to say about the cap, 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 capital efficiency in the in the arc out of round payments model, it basically becomes a function of how how soon before the expiry people are gonna wanna cycle and feel comfortable about cycling, maybe 48 hours, right? And then and then. On the other side, the expiry window, right? If the expiry window is 30 days and people cycle every two days, then the total liquidity you need for everyone to just constantly cycle over is two out of 30, which is like 8%, 7, 8%. So that's probably okay as a like capital requirement for the orchestrator over all the 
money that people have. I think in Lightning right now it's way higher than that, right? Because in all these channels you have all this money sitting there from on the other side that is not doing anything. Like in, in, in Lightning, I don't know the, the statistics. How much is the total user balance divided by all the liquidity in the LSP, like purely routing node channels, right? Because that is that is that is that is the capital. Huh? No, I mean, like, what is the what is the money that is just there to facilitate payments, and what is the money that is there that is actually making payments, right? That 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 ratio is the capital efficiency, and with ARC in the out of round payments channel and like a 30 30 day window, it would be like around 10 percent, I think, which I think is way better than Lightning can usually be. Yes. Yeah. Again? Yeah. Uh, yes, but only in a round, right? Like if, you, if you're in a round, yes, you need to come online, you need to say you're going to do this, you get all this information, then you sign this, and then it's done. So this is going to be like, it's going to take a while, like a minute or something, right? But if you do, uh, now I need to go back to the, to the outer round, I can just do it here. If you do outer, outer round, and this is just your transaction, then there's like, you just create this, sign it, sign it, send it here. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to go back to the slide. But if, if this is not a forfeit transaction, but an outer round transaction, right? And all this like right side is not there, you just you just sign this, send it to your counterparty, and then again together with all this, and then the, your counterparty is satisfied. Okay. No, that's an out of out of rounds. It's has nothing to do with covenant, right? Because that those transactions already exist. Uh, No, like Alice can just create this, and it needs to be online with the service provider. Yes, the service provider is always online. So Alice goes to the service provider, gives him this, ask, put your signature here as well, and then she can send this to Eve asynchronously, like via email or something, right? And then Eve can come online and say, okay, now I have money, because Alice sends all this, and these transactions are pre-signed, right? Yeah, yeah, out of round model. Yeah, yeah, for the, for the in-round model, you either come online, ask all the different trees that have happened since you got offline, and then find them, or you'd also have the users uh, send their packages to each other over an off-network channel, over an off network channel, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, they're well, yeah, okay. I, I see what you mean, because you don't have insight in who's in the signatures. It could be a single key because it's music, right? Uh, good point, like. But there's no latest state here, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you query all the round data, you actually get all the pep keys, but yeah, I mean, there's no way for you to very verify that this is not like 100 pub keys that the ASP created. That's a valid point. Um, there. Yeah. Currently, we're, we're on purpose using ephemeral keys. So all these users are using ephemeral keys, deleting them on purpose, right? Because if they're deleted, it's all safe. If they would reuse their leave keys, you could validate that actually Alice is part of all this. But I mean, it's it's nicer if they actually delete their keys so they can never be. What is this disco? <laughs> you had a question? Yes, it has. It it involves having to like in the outer round model. It involves having to trust Alice and the ASP not to collude and double sign this transaction. 
But you can trivially prove to the public that the ASP double sign, and then it will hopefully get out of business, right? Yes, after the fact, yeah. 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 Yeah, but the nice thing is here, Alice, uh, Eve now has the choice, right? She can, she can hold this, say, I'm fine with this. Maybe the amount is low enough that she's fine with this, like relying on the reputation of the ASP. Or she can spend it immediately, uh, he, Eve, is she can spend it immediately and get one where she, he, <laughs> she actually took part in the whole signing of the tree and then like, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, then it's kind of similar to Bitcoin, right? You wait 10 minutes um, and you see if you're not being double spent. Huh? No, no, yeah, okay, this is instant, and then you choose whether you want to, like, yeah, get out of it. Well, but it's better than zero confidence, it's not just Alice, right? It's Alice plus the reputation of the ASP. Yeah, yeah or state chain, which is this. Yeah? <laughs> and thank you, Arona. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this. So like, yeah, so there's, so, so, so yeah, fees is two things, right? So what, what fee is the ASP gonna charge you? Yeah, so this will be a function of, first of all, like the on-chain cost will be split, but that will be pr probably quite minimal. Then, the liquidity cost, which will depend on how old your input VTXLs are, they're, they're gonna probably charge you like something per hour, per day, whatever, right? Whatever the market rate is, you're like, okay, you're gonna, you're, you have seven more days on your VTXO, so you're gonna like pay seven days of liquidity for whatever value you have. And then probably some small risk factor just in case the user needs to go online and the ASP needs to like go and contest that. And then the second fee question is like on-chain fees, right? So right now, yeah, sir, for me. No, well, in, in the worst case, they have an equal cost, right? So like if the user cheats, the user needs to first enroll and then the ASP needs to enroll. And actually the, the, for, the, for the connector, we're not using a tree at this point, we're using like a chain. So the, the connector is like a single on-chain transaction, so the user will always have a higher on-chain cost if they try to cheat. No, the ASP just waits, right? The, the user enrolls if the ASP is, the ASP then gets this, the, no, the ASP just gets this if the user does nothing, right? Yeah, the very top just like expires and then this all disappears and then the ASP can just take it. So the on-chain fee, best case, is just like amortized small transaction divided by a really high number of users, so it's gonna be like really low, whatever. Um, well, to answer the second part of the question, on-chain fees, Currently, all of these just leave uh, an offer min relay, and then all the leaves have a dust anchor, and then the user, if, if the user needs to go offline, yeah. Huh? No, min relay is one set per vbind. I know. <laughs> yeah, so it's gonna be actual min relay, whatever. It's, um, and we're actually, right now, the ASP just fronts that, because the ASP knows that the user, the user is gonna have to pay more on top of that than it can actually win from taking them, so probably the users will not do that if the ASP service them and then the ASP will just get the money back. So actually, yeah, I don't know. And the second part is then you have a dust anchor. If the user wants to spend this, they will have to spend the dust anchor and then pay the, pay the whole CPFP game. Um, yeah, I talked with Gloria and she said never gonna work. Well, package relay, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's always the case. It has, doesn't even have to do with fees, right? Like, it, it depends more on the value of this compared to the fee, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's kind of an incentive thing. It's definitely a big reputation thing, which I think in many cases makes a lot of sense. It's also an incentive thing, but it's also something you know up front, right? You know, okay, I'm going to get this $5 VTXO. I see that these fees are really low, so I'm going to have to pay like $20 to get this on chain. It doesn't mean, it mean much for me. But Lightning has the same. It's just that here it's a little bit bigger because now it's like multiple transactions, right? At some point, we might have a mad thing where you have a one transaction ex uh, optimistic exit and something, and then you don't have the whole tree thing, uh, but that's not currently possible. Uh, well, he was first. Yeah, so if you have a lot of VTXOs, it makes a lot of sense for you to consolidate them and have a higher value VTXO, right? So like, if, if you see one of your VTXOs is going to expire, you see that you have an, another few that are going to expire in the next few days, you're going to probably spend them all and give you one big one because each one of these that you have, you're going to have to put on chain in the worst case. So like, if they are bigger value, it obviously makes more sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Last question, apparently. <laughs> What do you mean? Yeah, so like uh, a good guy ASP is just going to tell you like, hey, if you don't sweep it, I'm just going to give it to you back. And actually the ASP can be compelled to publish proofs that all of the leaves are actually either spent by the user or refunded in the next tree so that like if your ASP is kind of like a really nice guy, you're just not even have to make any transactions and you just get the, the VTOs back. But then it becomes even more of a reputation game um, but obviously, maybe for five dollars that makes sense. Maybe for it's what? <laughs> well, if it happens like right in the same moment, and you actually use this as the input for the next one, then maybe you never even have any money. Okay, that was the last question. Thank you, guys.